So um, I'm here to talk to you guys today about Honeycomb plus Fido. So real quick, how many people um, have some notion of what Fido is? <laughs> so you'll, I apologize, I'm laughing at the guy in the back of the room who used to program for it, um, <laughs> who didn't raise his hand. Um, <laughs> okay, um, so and, and how many folks have heard me talking about uh, honeycomb over the years. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. So I'm going to do a real quick discussion of FIDO just to provide some level set for folks who weren't in the last talk. Uh, so FIDO is a new consortium at the Linux Foundation. Uh, basically, it's you know fast data, FD.io, typically pronounced FIDO. Um, and the scope of this consortium is actually IO services. Uh, networking is clearly one of those pieces, but it's not the only one. Storage is also in there, several other things as well. Um, and we define IO services as being IO, which is how do I get data, think of Hackett, because we're all networking guys, from hardware, think Nix, to a frickin' thread on a core, so I can do something with it. And it turns out that actually doing that at high performance is deeply non-trivial, um, and the DPDK guys have done a brilliant job of it. The next step up is processing. So now I have this data, it's on a thread. Victory. Now what do you do? You do things like classify, transform, prioritize, forward, or terminate that. In our case, packet. So typical packet processing. And then you have management agents. Now management agents are the things that run local to the box that manage this ION processing so that we actually can control it potentially from off the box. So I talked a lot about VPP last session. Um, I'm not going to talk so much about it here. There's a ton of information available, and I'm happy to talk to people afterwards. But VPP basically gives you a vRouter vSwitch out of the box. It can do you know, bridging. It can do virtual bridge. It can do bridge domains. You can set up tunnels and connect them to bridge domains. You can program ARP termination. You can program static bridge table entries. You can program thousands of VRFs with millions of routes. Uh, and it continues to perform even at scale. So I'm going to go really briefly before I get to Honeycomb into how you go about programming VPP. So VPP has a very complete API that allows you to control all of its features. Um, that API uses a shared memory message queue, so it's intrinsically local to the box, and semantically it's very low level. Um, this gives you extremely high performance. You know, you can push half a million routes per second into the damn thing, which if any of you have ever had to deal with how do I program data planes before, that's pretty good. Um, in addition, the low level API uses a domain specific language, a DSL, to specify the messages that get sent over that messaging queue. And this DSL is used to generate C bindings for clients and also Java bindings for clients so that you can write semantically meaningful software in C or Java. Now, not the only two that could be done, it's just the two that happen to have been done. You could do other languages as well. Um, that's completely doable, but these are the two that have been done at this point. And the, the Java clients is about to become very significant in about, oh, about two slides. So the model for how you go about programming at a remote programmability model for VPP is you have a data plane management agent, which is an external application, that can expose whatever high-level API you would like. And that data plane management agent translates to the low-level API and speaks that to VPP. Obviously, it needs to run locally on the same box of the VPP instance. Yes? Oh, it's just shared memory. Just shared memory. I mean, technically, shared memory is standard, but in the most boring possible way. Um, <laughs> other questions? Cool. So this is actually really nice. Um, because it means you can have whatever high-level management agent suits your particular need. You're not forced into one particular choice. <clears throat> so this gets to really the crux of the matter. Uh, right now, available up at FIDO in the Honeycomb repo, we have a, um, a Honeycomb data management agent. 
So I know I asked how many folks had heard about Honeycomb before, because I've been talking about it. And I think the very first time I talked to you, Luis, I talked to you about it, uh, three years ago. Um, <laughs> so the idea with Honeycomb is that you strip open daylight down to a very small lean thing that acts as a local agent. And you have it control the local things. Now, this is not nearly as big a problem as controlling an entire network. But there are useful things you get out of open daylight that are really nice. One of them is you get NetConf Yang for free. You get REST for free via RESTConf. And you have other really handy things like a fully programmable uh, BGP implementation available to you to use as part of your control plane. So there are lots of things to recommend using ODL as an agent in this way. So we actually have an instance of using a, an ODL honeycomb agent. Now, there have been some people who've asked this. There's nothing intrinsic about the honeycomb model of approaching the world that says it has to talk to VPP. You could talk to other things with a honeycomb agent as well. And there's nothing in the VPP agent that knows or cares about the honeycomb agent. So you could bring other data plane management agents if you wanted to bind Quagga to it, if you wanted to write some other kind of data plane management agent. VPP just does not care, nor should it. So um, here's where we get to a little bit of the conversation about the interaction between Open Daylight, the controller, and Open Daylight, the Honeycomb agent. Um, I'm going to tend to refer to the Honeycomb agent as the agent and Open Daylight as the controller, because otherwise it gets so confusing. Um, so you could imagine having an app up in the Open Daylight controller that can netconf mount via netconf yang whatever models are being published by the, OD, by the Honeycomb agent down on the box. And when it manipulates those models, when it calls RPCs, when it writes things to the data tree via that mount, that will cause low-level API calls to go to VPP and changes what the behavior is in that local agent. So for example, um, well, actually, I'll get to this in a second because I'll talk about the models in the next few slides. Um, now, this is a really nice way of looking at the world. So, how many of you are familiar with file system mounts? Where you can say, okay, I want to mount that device, which you know, supposedly has a file system, under this point in the path. So Netconf mounts work semantically roughly the same way. I have a topology node that represents this particular box. I mount it there, which means I get all of its models as, sub as a subtree of that topology node. And so I can have multiple of them. I can manipulate them in the same way. I can write to them like data tree things. I can call their RPCs. I can subscribe to their notifications. So if you're used to programming in open daylight, this is going to be pretty familiar. So um, the example app that we have done so far uh, with the Honeycomb agent is a bridge domain example. So down on the Honeycomb agent, there's a Honeycomb bridge domain model. And essentially it says, I have a bunch of interfaces, full stop. Oh yes, and I might have bridge domains. You can configure bridge domains. And then you can associate um, a particular interface to a bridge domain, which are the happy little blue stars. Um, relatively straightforward conceptually. So that's the, the sort of first pass conceptually with what you're dealing with there. Uh, what I haven't shown here is you could also create tunnel interfaces and plug them in as well for whatever kind of tunnel you wanted. Now, it's important to remember VPP actually gets bridging. So once you said, I have an interface connected to this bridge, you're kind of done. Because you don't have to tell it what it should do when a Mac comes in there. It's got a learning bridge. Now, you can tell it things if they're helpful to you. So for example, when you drill down into the bridge domain model, you have things like bridge tables. So I can semantically say, I want to put a static bridge table entry there. Why would you want to do this? Well, imagine that your bridge is actually backing some virtual bridge domain where you've got tunnels. Flooding on tunnels is miserable, especially if they're going over WANs. And often you actually know what's on the other end of those tunnels. So you can very productively, from above the head, up in a controller app, say, OK, I'm going to program a bunch of bridge table information here. Uh, similarly, you have ARP termination tables, where you can say, OK, again, ARP. That is a perfectly lovely way to find out an address. God only knows what happens when you broadcast it over a tunnel. So if you actually know that information, you can program an ARP termination tunnel as well, a termination table. And there's a bunch of other features, split horizon and other things that are supported. 
but this is sort of the, the, the very high level tour of a local bridge domain. So then we get up into the Open Daylight controller app and we start looking at virtual bridge domains as an application. Now, the way this has been done is you have a multi-topology model approach to it where you have a virtual bridge domain topology and apologies, it's the world's most boring bridge. Um, two interfaces. Um, and you could attach interfaces to your virtual, you can create virtual bridge domains you could attach interfaces to them <coughs> that come from different underlay switches. From a virtual bridge domain point of view, it's just a bunch of interfaces available. Now, you can also drill down into the underlay topology from that virtual bridge domain. So you can say, okay, I've got this virtual bridge domain, I have these connected interfaces, what's the real underlay look like? And you can drill down to see the actual instances, VTP instances under it, the tunnels that connect them, and where they connect. And this is very powerful if you're trying to debug what's going on, because you could imagine just as an example, gee, um, I'm getting complaints where I don't seem to be passing traffic. Let's drill down and take a look. Oh wait, crap, that tunnel is toast. Or that tunnel's counters haven't moved at all. What's going on? Um, so it gives you a very complete picture of the world where you can zoom up to the thing that semantically matters to you, and you can also drill down to the operational thing that's really happening on the ground. So. Um, at this point, I'm going to do something potentially foolhardy. I pierce the AV, I has plugged me into audio, and I actually have a demo video that I'm going to try and jump to. Hang on. I had turned my internet off so that I didn't get like random page notifications. <laughs> uh, Okay, let's try this again. There we go. Oh. Hang on. Let me try and get that over there. There we go. Okay. And let me go back to the beginning. Ah. This is where I this is where I drop my notebook again.
No, you can ask questions at any point. Um, I actually have to get my slides displaying. Hang on. The playlist keeps going. Um, what kind of between this VSLAN or VXLAN. So it's it's automatically happening right now in the the VBridge application. Um, so basically, when you when you add, so think of it this way: I say I want a bridge domain. Uh, nothing really happens when I say I want a virtual bridge domain because there are no interfaces attached to it. I've got switch one. I connect an interface on switch one to the bridge domain. Goes out, creates a bridge domain, connects the interface to the, the bridge domain on switch one. Then I say I want to connect to my virtual bridge domain an interface on switch two. So goes out, creates the a bridge on bridge two, attaches the interface to it, and then it has to stand up the tunnel between them. It automatically stands up the tunnel between them. So, very good question. Uh, what we're doing right now is a little bit hacky, which is it goes and it looks for IP addresses on L3 ports that are already configured on both boxes, and it uses one of those. Um, obviously, you'd like to be able to set a default behavior in the virtual bridge domain app where you can say, hey, for this VPP, possibly overridden for this bridge domain, this is the default address and the default end cap I'd like you to use. And then obviously, you would also want for a virtual bridge domain to be able to configure a VNI. Um, but that's the kind of thing, right now we're just generating the VNIs uh, as we go. Yes? So is this tunnel is shared by all the bridge On that particular bridge. Um, so, so here's the thing. Um, yeah, and this is, this is where it's unfortunate that people use the tunnel terminology around this, but it, it's gotten to be quite commonplace. You have a freaking end cap, right? A tunnel is just a mental construct. Um, and what your end cap basically does is, in the case of VXLAN is, I have a sor IP source and dust, um, I have a VNI, and I'm putting some traffic across it. Now obviously, you, for you know, a, a, an end cap choice, you would want to have a VNI per bridge domain, because otherwise you start flooding traffic onto other people. Right? And so whether or not you choose to represent it as an in-cap or as tunnels, you've got to get that piece right. Um, you know, frankly, logistically, it doesn't make a huge difference. It's just a matter of the in-caps that come in and the in-caps that go out. I mean, it is a little more expensive using the tunnel mechanism, but you don't even hit that wall until about 80,000 tunnels on VPP. So, <laughs> yeah. No, SFC is a lot more deliberate. SFC is a much more deliberate thing. I agree. Yes, yes. So, um, other questions about any of this before I move on to the rest of the slides? Yes. So, what was the one thing we all decided after hydrogen? The one thing we decided, I am no longer allowed to name things. <laughs> Enough said. So no, I have no problem with your, your suggestion. <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. So it, it, there, in some cases, so for example, in the agent, we're currently using the IETF interface model. Um, and then for the bridge domains themselves, we, we've created our own model for the bridge domains. Um, but right now in the agent we're using the IETF interface model. It has pluses and minuses like every other model. Um, and then for the virtual bridge domain, there's an attempt to make things somewhat fractal in the sense that the virtual bridge domain has the same, uses the same grouping as the bridge domains that are down in the particular, you know, on the honeycomb agent. So that, for example, if I were to configure in a virtual bridge domain a bridge table entry, you would like the bridge virtual bridge domain application to translate that into bridge table entries down on the various agents. So you have a fractalness to the model. Um, it turns out that having a fully fractal model doesn't end up being quite what you want. 
but you want to be as close as you can so that you're talking about the same thing. Um, so when I'm talking about G, I have an ARP termination tunnel. So if, if I were to have, extend the virtual bridge domain app to handle ARP termination tunnels, which you probably want to do in a virtual bridge domain because you don't want to ARP over tunnels, you would basically say, okay, great. So um, I will use exactly the same ARP termination group model that I have in the bridge. If I poke it into the virtual bridge domain and ARP termination entry, then the virtual bridge domain should go and put that ARP termination entry in all the relevant switches in their bridge domains down on the particular agents. Um, this makes it very easy semantically. I know, like, if you've ever, I, I know a lot of folks here have, um, have tried to go and, like, write all the flows to do things like handle automatic ARP response locally so you're not, you know, ARP termination via flows and figuring out all the places to do that and doing that. I mean, once you've done it, it's automated. But it's just nice semantically to say, I don't even care how that happens. The virtual bridge domain app takes care of that. All I can say is, I know where that damn box is, right? So, I, I, or rather, I know that box's MAC address. Why should anyone ever ARP for it again? Uh, or have that ARP get away from the local box? So, um, other questions about this? Because I have more slides. <laughs> Not many more slides. So, um, obviously, FIDO has a lot more features than what I just showed you with bridge domains. Uh, which you want to expose via uh, honeycomb. So the, the, the classic example that comes to mind is routing tables with VRFs. You would like to be able to you know, expose those via honeycomb agent. And then there's a whole interesting debate as to what you want to do for virtualized VR, VRFs as a model up on the, uh, the open daylight controller. It's a thornier issue <laughs> to do that particular app than to do the virtual bridge domain. But it's definitely a doable thing. Uh, and just to give you some idea of how many more features, and this is actually a partial list, this is a summary of VPP features. You know, we've got you know, millions of FIB entries, thousands of VRFs, uh, multi-path, both ECMP and, and unequal cost. Uh, we can do class of multiple millions of classifiers um, you know, fairly deep into the packet, and they're, they're arbitrary classifiers. Um, you've got counters for everything that is exposed operationally. You'd want to expose via the models. Uh, you've got all the standard sorts of tunnel types. We've got support for segment routing. Uh, for those of you who have looked at operator networks where people are trying to treat v4 as just a service that runs over v6, we have 4 over 6 software. Uh, we have some support for OAM, so you can actually trace traffic through the process and make sure that you're actually getting things working correctly. There's support for MPLS. Uh, you know, all the standard, standard L2 support you could want. Um, all of that is there and available and usable but you'd like to expose it via a honeycomb agent so you have a common consistent model with which to program all of this stuff. So, um, yeah, so that was, you know, basically talking through the features. This is sort of a little bit broader. I had a slide that was sort of like this in the last talk, but this is a little more detailed. If you look at FIDO and Honeycomb and ODL in an OpenStack world, we already know that we have an ODL plugin for Neutron that will talk, take you from Neutron all the way down to Open Daylight. And then in Open Daylight, we've got a variety of providers that work with OpenStack. And the notion would be you could have a Honeycomb agent. Now, I've been talking to you about Honeycomb and Fido. I've talked to other people here who would like to be able to use the same Honeycomb approach with the same models on OVS or on other data paths. Now, there's a lot to recommend this, because from the controller point of view, we're programming things semantically. From, you know, and we get consistent semantic models coming up. You also start following the conventional wisdom because you've probably noticed that there's a big drift away from trying to have a, a big open flow programmer in the sky that tries to program a bunch of switches towards having a local agent that does the actual open flow programming if you're doing open flow. So you can do that with Honeycomb. And so it gives you a really nice story about how to proceed here. And again, the honeycomb is just a stripped down ODL. You get NetConf Yang. Um, what also gets to be particularly interesting about this, I think there's a, another presentation going on today or tomorrow about distributed transactions over NetConf. And once you bring in distributed transactions, this gets to be an even more compelling story. So any questions about this? Yes. So it depends on, on what your data path is, right? So if your data path is FIDO, FIDO is perfectly happy to be programmed to do ARP termination, 
So, you know, at that point, you, you say, hey, I want our termination table entry. It goes and programs that. Um, if you're talking about Honeycomb talking to OVS, you can actually, and I, I've, it's been a long time, you can actually, if you know that you want a particular ARP response, you can actually tell the Honeycomb agent, just like you would tell it for FIDO, here's an ARP termination entry, you can tell it the same thing and it can program that into the open flow data path as well. Other questions or? So unlike the last talk, which ran quite a bit over, this may actually end a little bit early. Um, okay, so um, one more piece here, which is sort of getting to the next steps, which is to get involved. Um, basically, the code for Honeycomb is actually already available. Uh, I just showed you the Honeycomb uh, demo video. Um, and there is a project proposal for a Honeycomb virtual bridge domain project, um, which I'm hoping will be scheduled for creation review in the not too distant future so that the virtual bridge domain code can go there. And the hope there is that um, other apps will find the virtual bridge domain to be a useful thing. So rather than having a million different apps reaching down to the Honeycomb agent, which interestingly enough would work, the app coexistence problem is way easier than the app coexistence problem you get with OpenFlow. Um, but it's just nice to have one set of people sort that problem out and then you know, make it available to the community so anyone who needs a virtual bridge domain can just program one. And this is the end of my slides. I'm, I'm open for any other questions people have. Go ahead. So how would you uh, begin an actual operation? Is it a, a learn that path or is it a program? Oh, the, the, so in FIDO, it has, it, the bridge domains are learning bridges. Now, you can program static bridge table entries. So you can do smart things if you have smart things to do. But you don't have to mindlessly figure out all of that up in the controller and shove it all down. If you just connect interfaces and you don't really quite know, uh, that all works. I mean, for example, it might be the case that you have a bridge domain where you don't control the entire bridge domain. You just have another tunnel that, that heads off one end of it. Well, you know, you can do that um, without having to go and manually program those entries or, you know, having to deal with all the rest of the issues that comes with that. So, yeah, you do have a learning bridge there. Other questions? On the previous slide, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, I wouldn't put it in terms of lost, because you still have an Opendale, con Opendale controller in the picture, right? <clears throat> it's just rather than, than programming a bunch of flows down and having a bunch of applications step on each other's toes as they program flows, um, instead what you have is a honeycomb uh, agent that you talk to via NetConf Yang. So rather than saying, okay, and, and for those of you in the room who've had to deal with this, okay, I need to program flows for a bridge domain, and I need to do source path checking, and I need to program the ARP termination flows, and I also need to program the flows for the flooding, and a million other things you'd have to worry about, all of which are stock switch features that just work in FIDO. You can say, I want a bridge domain, and I'd like to connect this interface to it. It's enormously easier, it takes way more traffic effort, uh, effort in terms of traffic, takes less compu computations on the controller, um, and you actually get the state that you care about and are interested in, in terms of the counters, rather than having to back map a bunch of flow counters to the counters you're actually trying to represent semantically, you actually have the semantic counters you want. <clears throat> yep. Other questions? Sorry, what? <clears throat> well, what's actually really fascinating here is you still have complete control in the data plane. You just have different points of exercise. So one of the things I know we've all run into who've actually gotten deep into OpenFlow is coming to the realization there's something you need in terms of match action features or other things that isn't currently available. And now you've got to go try and get patches into OVS. You've got to try and get patches into the kernel. Uh, you've got a bunch of this other stuff to do. I'm going to kill this, sorry. I'm just going to unplug. Um, you've got a bunch of other things that you need to do to make this all work. Um, so let's say you want to do something funky with the data plane that currently FIDO doesn't do, right? So you can go and start a project at FIDO with you and your friends. You can write your plugin. Now you actually can do exactly the thing you need to do. 
And you can then expose the API to that, expose the models, and away you go. So you actually have the ability to control end to end what it is you need to do. You actually have more control than you have right now. Uh, I'll give you a good example. Uh, I, I don't know, I've not been paying attention the last few months. Did uh, contracting actually make it in to OVS yet? Because con connection tracking is a very trivial thing to do in FIDO. It's just another lookup table. You can produce a node that does it and away you go. It may have. I, I, like I said, I haven't had it in the last six months, I've been a little heads down. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, it's a few weeks worth of work, not a few years, not a, over a year worth of work to get the feature in uh, if you're doing it in FIDO. So you actually have more control in FIDO. Um, it's just you get to express that control semantically. And, you know, if you need a thing that's not there, you can go and get the thing that's not there. Well, but and, and the idea is to standardize the API at the semantic level, uh, where, okay, great, I'm talking about bridge domains, I'm talking about routing tables, I'm talking about, you know, how I'm going to configure interfaces, including tunneling interfaces, I'm talking about all these kinds of things. Because um, the truth of the matter is, there are so many extensions going around right now in OpenFlow. Um, I mean, this is one of the things that came up in our conversations about app coexistence, is are we doing this for general app coexistence, or are we just doing it for OVS? And a lot of what came back was almost every single app we have uses some o OVS extension. Um, so, you know, it, you, when you talk about standardization of APIs, you have to ask yourself how much is real and how much is cosmetic. In this case, do we, I have to use um, uh, open uh, daylight, or can I just use the FIDO infrastructure as some other application that controls it? No, you can absolutely. So, you can use the VPP piece with any data plane management agent you want. It doesn't have to be Honeycomb. Um, Honeycomb exposes NetConf and RESTConf. So you can use anything that can talk to NetConf or talk to REST to control the Honeycomb agent. So you could go off and do something completely different. You could do it directly if you wanted to, yeah. I mean, you've got C bindings available to you. You could generate Python bindings if you wanted. You could absolutely do it directly. Um, if you're doing it directly, though, you know, you could absolutely do it directly, but one of the interesting things as you look into use cases is OpenStack does a very good job of managing VMs that you deploy via OpenStack. Increasingly, as you look at things like NFV, you look at more sophisticated solutions, the scope of things that you need to be able to manage over is bigger than that. So, but yeah, no, it could be done directly. Uh, in terms of getting along, I mean, you, could, you can weld any SDN protocol you like on top of, of FIDO. Um, you know, if it, does, if it wants to express things that FIDO doesn't currently express, you would have to actually also build some graph nodes for it. I know I've talked to some of the IO Visor guys. They're quite interested in providing nodes to support eBPF support. Um, I imagine you could do something quite similar with P4 if you wanted to. Um, the real question you have to ask yourself is, um, for the use case you're considering, does it make more sense to implement the semantic thing you actually want in FIDO as graph nodes, we are the full power of C, um, as opposed to trying to use P4 to express it and then semantically configure the thing you want. So it's the level of what kind of semantics are useful for the problem you're trying to solve um, versus the work involved. So you could absolutely use any SDN protocol you'd like. You could weld OpenFlow, P4, anything on top of it. It's just a question of does it make your life easier or harder for the use case you're trying to deal with. So, other questions? Cool. I am inclined to give you back the, the, the balance of the time if folks don't have other questions. If people want to come up to me, I'm here the next couple days. I'd be happy to talk to people. Um, so, yeah. Thank you guys for all coming. Uh, I'm really excited about this as an approach to things. I, I, I think it makes a lot of sense. Hopefully you all do too, at least for certain use cases. The next step up is processing. So now I have this data, it's on a thread. Victory. Now what do you do? You do things like classify, transform, prioritize, forward, or terminate that. In our case, packet. So typical packet processing. And then you have management agents. Now management agents are the things that run local to the box 
that manage this ION processing so that we actually can control it potentially from off the box. So I talked a lot about VPP last session. Um, I'm not going to talk so much about it here. There's a ton of information available, and I'm happy to talk to people afterwards. But VPP basically gives you a vRouter or vSwitch out of the box. It can do you know, bridging. It can do virtual bridge. You can do bridge domains. You can set up tunnels and connect them to bridge domains. You can program ARP termination. You can program static bridge table entries. You can program thousands of VRFs with millions of routes. Uh, and it continues to perform even at scale. So I'm going to go really briefly before I get to Honeycomb into how you go about programming VPP. So VPP has a very complete API that allows you to control all of its features. Um, that API uses a share. So um, I'm here to talk to you guys today about Honeycomb plus FIDO. So real quick, how many people um, have some notion of what FIDO is? <laughs> So you'll, I apologize, I'm laughing at the guy in the back of the room who used to program for it, um, who didn't raise his hand. Um, <laughs> okay, um, so, and, and how many folks have heard me talking about uh, Honeycomb over the years? Okay, <laughs> excellent. So I'm gonna do a real quick discussion of FIDO just to provide some level set for folks who weren't in the last talk. Uh, so FIDO is a new consortium at the Linux Foundation. Uh, basically, it's you know, fast data, FD.io, typically pronounced FIDO. Um, and the scope of this consortium is actually IO services. Uh, networking is clearly one of those pieces, but it's not the only one. Storage is also in there, several other things as well. Um, and we define IO services as being IO, which is how do I get data, think of Hackett, because we're all networking guys, from hardware, think Nix, to a frickin' thread on a core so I can do something with it. And it turns out that actually doing that at high performance is deeply non-trivial, um, and the DPDK guys have done a brilliant job of it. Oh, it's just shared memory. Just shared memory. I mean, technically shared memory is standard, but in the most boring possible way. Um. <laughs> Other questions? Cool. So this is actually really nice um, because it means you can have whatever high-level management agent suits your particular need. You're not forced into one particular choice. <clears throat> so this gets to really the crux of the matter. Uh, right now, available up at FIDO in the Honeycomb repo, we have a, um, a Honeycomb data management agent. So I know I asked how many folks had heard about Honeycomb before, because I've been talking about it. And I think the very first time I talked to you, Luis, I talked to you about it, uh, three years ago. Um, so the idea with Honeycomb is that you strip open daylight down to a very small lean thing that acts as a local agent. And you have it control the local things. Now, this is not nearly as big a problem as controlling an entire network. But there are useful things you get out of open daylight that are really nice. One of them is you get NetConf Yang for free. You get REST for free via RESTConf. And you have other really handy things like a fully programmable uh, BGP implementation available to you to use as part of your control plane. So there are lots of third memory message queues. So it's intrinsically local to the box. And semantically, it's very low level. Um, this gives you extremely high performance. You, know, you can push half a million routes per second into the damn thing which if any of you have ever had to deal with how do I program data planes before, that's pretty good. Um, in addition, the low-level API uses a domain-specific language, a DSL, to specify the messages that get sent over that messaging queue. And this DSL is used to generate C bindings for clients and also Java bindings for clients so that you can write semantically meaningful software in C or Java. Now, not the only two that could be done, it's just the two that happen to have been done. You could do other languages as well. Um, that's completely doable, but these are the two that have been done at this point. And the, the Java clients is about to become very significant in about, oh, about two slides. So <clears throat> the model for how you go about programming at a remote programmability model for VPP is you have a data plane management agent, 
which is an external application that can expose whatever high-level API you would like. And that data plane management agent translates to the low-level API and speaks that to VPP. Obviously, it needs to run locally on the same box of the VPP instance. Yes? Things to recommend using ODL as an agent in this way. So we actually have an instance of using a, an ODL honeycomb agent. Now, there have been some people who've asked this. There's nothing intrinsic about the honeycomb model of approaching the world that says it has to talk to VPP. You could talk to other things with a honeycomb agent as well. And there's nothing in the VPP agent that knows or cares about the honeycomb agent. So you could bring other data plane management agents if you wanted to bind Quagga to it, if you wanted to write some other kind of data plane management agent. VPP just does not care, nor should it. So um, here's where we get to a little bit of the conversation about the interaction between Open Daylight, the controller, and Open Daylight, the honeycomb agent. Um, I'm going to tend to refer to the honeycomb agent as the agent and Open Daylight as the controller, because otherwise it gets so confusing. Um, so you could imagine having an app up in the Open Daylight controller that can netconf mount via netconf yang whatever models are being published by the, OD, by the honeycomb agent down on the box. And when it manipulates those models, when it calls RPCs, when it writes things to the data tree via that mount, that will cause low-level API call 